This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, an emotional day at Supreme Court. As disturbing details emerge in the Trent Butt murder trial and the Crown outlines how Quinn Butt died. And we also have this story. You will not be able to have five or six payday loans. You can have one. Legislation regulating the payday loan industry is finally coming into effect. You can hear more on that story coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Powerful and emotional testimony in Supreme Court today in the murder trial of Trent Butt. The Carboneer man faces charges of first degree murder and arson. All of this in connection to the death of his five year old daughter Quinn three years ago. Here now's Mark Quinn joins us live now from the newsroom. But first, a warning that some of the testimony may be disturbing to some viewers. So Mark, what happened? Well, Carolyn, it was a really brutal and emotionally charged day at Supreme Court today. First, the lawyers, both the Crown and Defence lawyers, laid out their, what they're going to argue happened on the day that Quinn Butt died. And then there was the heart-wrenching testimony of Quinn Butt's mother, Andrea Goss. Now, Quinn's father, Trent Butt, is accused of planning and intentionally killing her. He, sh he has shown no emotions in the day leading up to the trial, but today Trent Butt put his head in his hands and sobbed as his lawyer said, but didn't intend to kill his daughter and he doesn't remember doing it. Derek Hogan says Butt remembers kneeling over Quinn's body and concluding he had smothered her. He says Butt then decided to kill himself and burn down the Carboneer home that he co-owned with his estranged wife, Andrea Goss. But the Crown portrayed what happened very differently. Lloyd Strickland said a 10-page letter found in Trent Butt's truck after the fire said, I have taken my daughter's and my life. He said Butt admits he wrote that, and the Crown lawyer called that letter a murder-suicide letter. Strickland said Butt killed his 5-year-old daughter to punish Andrea Goss because he held such animosity towards her. Then there was powerfully emotional testimony from Goss herself. Goss cried when she said Quinn was her only child and wept again as she described rushing to the scene of the fire and then finding that her daughter Quinn had died. Family and supporters, men and women who were in the court today could be heard crying as she left the, the stand sobbing. Now the trial will continue tomorrow and it's expected to last for three more weeks. Anthony? Reporting live from our newsroom, also in the court, still no verdict today in the Al Potter murder trial. The jury has been deliberating ever since it was sequestered around lunchtime yesterday. Well, it's not likely that a verdict is going to be reached today, and that's because when the jury asked to listen back to a portion of Potter's two-day testimony, they were told that they would have to listen to all of it. Now, 55-year-old Potter claimed that self-defense, that's his defense, and that he was protecting himself against a knife-wielding Dale Porter. The Crown contends it was first-degree murder. A former international student at Memorial University is now facing one less criminal charge. Masai Alabakshi is accused of attacking a fellow international student on Signal Hill two years ago. Today, the Crown withdrew a charge of administering a noxious substance to the same alleged victim. That's because there's no reasonable probability of conviction. Alabakshi is accused of trying to kill the man on the North Head Trail on April 2017 when both of them tumbled down the cliff. He's headed to trial in September to face those allegations. An accused murderer has been granted bail in St. John's. 36-year-old Philip Butler is accused of killing his older brother, George. The RNC is called, uh, was called rather to the accused home in Upper Gullies one night in May of last year. And inside, officers found his older brother, 43-year-old George Allen Butler, dead. Philip Butler was granted bail this morning after paying $15,000 and putting up a surety. Well, this morning when we woke up, uh, quite a chilly day, especially through parts of central, rather chilly morning. Uh, Badger minus 21 this morning. We're seeing a temperature around minus 8 as you walked out the door in St. John's. And then temperatures quite cold. Lab City sitting at minus 29 this morning. Now those temperatures have recovered uh, this afternoon, climbing into the minus single digits right across most of the island. And then uh, up through Labrador again, quite uh, Seasonal around minus eight for Nain today. Now, 
Uh, the big story really was the snow this afternoon. Most of the island actually saw some clearing skies at some point this afternoon, uh, but that snow has moved through and will continue to do so as we head through the next couple of hours. The most of the snow is falling for the southeastern portion of the Avalon. Already seeing amounts on Twitter a couple of hours ago for Cape Pine region, around 17 centimeters of snow uh, up through the St. John's at the St. John's Airport. Rather, uh, we see about four centimeters. Of of snow like I said it will continue could pick up uh, between five plus more centimeters as we head through the next couple of hours I'll have all those details and your full forecast when I come back Anthony the body of a missing man in southern Labrador has been found police say the 66 year old man from Black Tickle had been seal hunting and was reported overdue the RCMP got a call around 730 Monday evening that the man's body was found in water near double islands that's a remote location about 11 kilometers from Black Tickle. Police say the man didn't go through the ice, but somehow ended up in the water. The chief medical examiner's office is involved in the ongoing investigation. Police do not suspect criminal activity. Well, after several hurdles, the provincial government is finally ready to bring in payday loan legislation. The regulations were published at the beginning of this month and will come into effect at the start of April. As here and now's Meg Roberts reports, this province is now catching up to others. We are so happy that we've forgotten. It's almost like giving birth. You forget the labor pains. Uh, you know, we, uh, we, our hat is off to the government. It's been almost three years since the provincial government passed legislation intended to protect customers from the payday loan industry. Payday loans are a relatively small amount of money lent at a high rate of interest on the agreement. It will be repaid when the borrower receives their next paycheck. But that legislation could not be proclaimed into law until the federal government provided an exemption in the criminal code. That happened in December. Today, financial literacy advocates are celebrating. So what this legislation does, as paternalistic as it sounds, not deliberately paternalistic, it saves people from themselves. The legislation will increase borrowers' awareness of their rights when entering into the payday loan agreement. It will lower the cost of interest and will provide customers with remedies when payday lenders do not honor their responsibilities. Antle says these regulations will especially help those who are most vulnerable in the community. The payday loan industry claims that they are primarily providing service to, to lower middle class incomes. That's not been our experience. It's chosen by people at the lower end of the income scale who have run out of all other borrowing options and who are desperate for cash now. Mohammed Abdallah has witnessed that firsthand. He's the co-founder of a homeless shelter for seniors. He says because seniors are on fixed incomes, it's very common for them to turn to payday loan places. Abdallah says these regulations are just a start at protecting some of the senior population. See that sometimes there's, there's, there's no solution. The income is way less than the needs. And what can you do? You have to ask for money. It's one step towards better, but it's not where it's supposed to be yet. Um, we still need to look into why people are borrowing. We need to see the turnover of people coming back to ask for money. There is a reason there. On April 1st, it becomes the law, catching up with regulations across the rest of the country. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Independent marijuana retailers say they are not earning enough to stay in business, but the province is willing to help. Stories like this one only keep about 8% of what they sell, so if you buy a gram of pot for $12, the store gets less than a dollar of that to cover staff, rent, insurance, and its other costs. Store owners say that's just not enough. Thomas Clark says the other problem is what little pot they're able to get is often of lower quality than what you can buy on the street. People come into the shop, see our selection. If they don't like it, they're going back to the black market. So in order for us to get the black market out of the equation, we need the quality to come up and the prices to stabilize and for small business owners to be given a fair shake. Now the province says it's willing to help what it calls tier one stores, the standalone pot shops that just sell marijuana and accessories. Already one store in Clarenville shut down because it couldn't keep stores stocked. Later this week, retailers will meet with the NLC and the finance minister says there should be help. Based on the fact they put a considerable investment in and supply has been an issue um, for all jurisdictions in the country, we want to ensure that 
you know, we look at uh, at uh, the tier one independence, and I mean, if there's something the NLC can do to help them, I've asked them. Well, government is shutting down the NDP's idea for an all-party committee on rate mitigation. The New Democrats say a committee would look at the best way to take the burden off the taxpayer, and it says the current government has failed to release a plan to lower electricity rates. But Premier Dwight Ball says his government has its own ideas to lower costs, which is why the party is going to vote against the NDP's proposal. To me, uh, this single today that the NDP does not have a plan for rate mitigation in Newfoundland and Labrador, and we also know that the PC party, the only plan that they have is to pick a fight with Ottawa. Well, I'm rather surprised and rather e egregious of the, of the uh, Premier to stand here, as I understand he did, and announce that they're voting against it without even hearing any of our arguments or our concerns. It, it's just another example of the arrogance of the government. And opinion is split when it comes to the satisfaction with Dwight Ball's liberals. According to the latest poll by Corporate Research Associates, 47% of voters say they are satisfied with the government. 46% say they are not. CRA says 45% of decided voters support the liberals down a point from November, while PC support is up three points to 38%. Support for the NDP is down a point to 16%. CRA says 28% of voters are undecided. CRA phoned 800 adult residents in this province between January 31st and February 24th, with overall results accurate to plus or minus 3.5 percentage points, 95 times out of 100. Today, the three leaders spoke about the latest polling results. I think it's an indication of what uh, the way forward, which was our vision for Newfoundland and Labrador. It's the only party with a vision, with a plan for Newfoundland and Labrador right now. I think, you know, there's a bunch of mixed signals in it. And uh, I don't see it as being an instrumental in the election call. I'm going to have the best growth rates. We've got all these undecided voters. It's going to make the biggest growth rates for sure. Well, to federal politics now, Justin Trudeau's longtime friend and former top advisor Gerald Butts gave his version of events that ended with the resignation of Jody Wilson-Raybould. He repeatedly denied that he or others in the government improperly pressured the former attorney general to settle a criminal case involving SNC-Lavalin. I spoke with the former attorney general once on this file on December 5th, 2018. In three and a half years in government, we had one brief discussion about it. She raised it with me at the end of a two-hour dinner at the Chateau Laurier Hotel. She requested the meeting via text message a few days earlier. Abbas claims it would be unfair to say that he personally pressured Wilson Raybould during that meeting. He says she requested it to discuss files other than SNC-Lavalin. He also says the former minister should have raised her concerns about inappropriate pressure directly with the prime minister. But says he only found out that Wilson Raybould had made a final decision about SNC Lavalin during her testimony last week. Now, for more insight into today's testimony and the action of the Justice Committee, we're going to check in with our Ottawa correspondent, Julie Van Dusen. That's coming up in about 15 minutes. Well, back in this province, fire gutted a house in Shoal Harbour overnight, leaving a family to rely on relatives for a place to stay and the Canadian Red Cross for emergency supplies like winter clothing and food. The parents were able to get themselves and their toddler and infant out of the house safely, but the bungalow has been destroyed. Now, staying in Shoal Harbour, terrible story. John Butt came across a disturbing sight in the community north of Clarenville as he went for a walk this morning. He noticed five dead ducks that appear to have been run over by a snowmobile. Now he spotted them on the ice, this by the local causeway, but says he then noticed these snowmobile tracks. He says there was a sixth duck on the ice and that one was still alive. Now this area is where people often feed the ducks, and but says he doesn't understand why anyone would hurt them. The ice was too unstable to try to rescue that surviving duck and he's taking his concerns to the local community council. It might not seem like a great night for running, but there's actually a race happening here in Bowery Park. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'm live, and I'll have that story coming up.
Next Weather Update is brought to you by 811 Healthline. Medical advice, health information, mental health, and healthy eating. Dial 811. It's free and confidential. Welcome and there we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I mentioned earlier that there is some snow coming down in the eastern part of the island mm -hmm. today, uh, but that's nothing compared to what people in Makovic are dealing with. Have a look at this video. Now we've seen videos of people opening their front door to big snow drifts, but look at the size of this one. <laughs> yeah. When you, when you move the camera out, you can see how deep it is, how far back it goes, and you can hear Jessica Winter say she can't even see the sky. Wow. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for sending that video along, Jessica, and hopefully <laughs> someone comes to dig you out soon, if not already. That is, that is insane. Wow, and look how far it goes. We cannot, we cannot climb out of that. No. The sky. That would stress me out. Yeah, the other hand, able to get out. claustrophobic, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Do you have a fridge, though, where you can... Yeah put stuff if you that's true it's a perfect to. fridge you gotta um, dig that stuff out too right and where do you where, where do, you do you put, put the it? snow right. next to the television yeah I mean, <laughs> inside <laughs> in the sink. Yeah. yeah i'm definitely not going to complain about the snow in the sink no shops. don't no but it it was a little bit slick earlier this afternoon yeah, and, it did and get is away. you know yeah. still pretty slick out there right now uh temperatures have dropped a little bit as well sitting in the minus single digits but minus six in st john's and then uh up through the northern peninsula a little bit cooler at minus 10. Cartwright's nice right now, minus eight. Uh, but as I mentioned, all of that uh, snow is moving in. We have two systems in play at this point. We've got that low off the coast of Labrador. You can see that counterclockwise motion today. And then we've got another system just skirting parts of uh, eastern Newfoundland. And that's where we're seeing all of that snow. So. Taking a look at that radar, you can see this the uh, heaviest snow right now still for the southwestern portion. We are starting to see that push off and it will continue to do so as we head through the next couple of hours. Anticipating another five plus centimeters down through the southern portions of the Avalon. We could pick up about 10 centimeters by the time it's all said and done uh, for the metro area. And that uh, will eventually taper off, like I said, by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. Uh, we are still looking at that potential for some flurries uh, in towards the morning hours down through the Buren Peninsula, but up through the coast of Labrador. Because we still got that system offshore, uh, we're starting to see some wraparound snow with that, and those winds are going to stay strong tonight. So we're looking at a blowing snow advisory for Hopedale up through Nain tonight with winds gusting upwards of about 70 kilometers per hour. So with that snow, we're seeing near zero vi visibility at times uh, through the overnight. But temperatures are going to dip tonight for most of the island, minus 17 for Cornerbrook. Southwest winds gusting upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour. Now heading towards the Avalon, the winds will pick up for a couple of hours this evening and then eventually ease by tomorrow morning. Uh, it should sit around minus seven is your overnight low for uh, St. John's and then Marystown sitting around minus 14 tonight. Now up through Labrador, those temperatures aren't really uh, moving too much. Labrador City going down to about minus 28 tonight again with those brisk winds overnight snow and blowing snow again across uh, coastal Labrador uh, down through the Straits though minus 19 with fair skies through the night tonight. Now looking into tomorrow we're starting to see that colder air wrap around which means we could see the potential for a few snow squalls uh, especially for the south coast Pyrene Peninsula as well as the Avalon Peninsula and then along the west coast through the afternoon tomorrow with lingering flurries uh, for coastal Labrador and then towards central around Happy Valley Goose Bay could pick up a couple centimeters tomorrow afternoon. And those winds will pick up right again tomorrow, right across the island uh, and then up through coastal Labrador. Eventually we'll see some clearing overnight uh, into Friday morning. So it's definitely good news there. Those temperatures will be sitting in the minus single digits tomorrow. Could see some peaks of sun once uh, the uh, system moves away. But again, those winds picking up out of the west, 40 gusting 70 kilometers per hour. Uh, as we head a little bit further west, dipping into about minus nine for Grand Falls, Windsor. Can't rule out the chance of a few flurries through the afternoon, but should see peaks of sun as well. And then west winds for uh, the west coast as well, upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. Up through uh, the northern peninsula, minus teens tomorrow, and then similar temperatures for Labrador with uh, not really going to see much relief along the coast as well as winds continue and that potential for some flurry. So snow and blowing snow certainly in the forecast. I will have a look ahead at your forecast because uh, the clocks are heading, uh, uh, are heading forward as well. I'll have all those details coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. 
Well, a hardy group is gathering in Bowering Park right now. Despite the snow, they're gearing up for a run. Now, it's all part of a cross-country effort that starts here in St. John's and stretches across to B.C., but its roots are in Afghanistan, where some women meet in secret to take part in a secret marathon to avoid persecution. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is in Bowering Park right now. So, Jeremy, tell us more about what's happening there tonight. Well, there's not much happening right at this exact moment, as you can see here behind me, but we are at the start line here in Bowering Park. Now, it's not an ideal night for running, but the people taking part in this event, well, they don't seem to care about that because it's all about showing support for everybody's ability and right to be able to run freely. And as you said in the intro, this actually stemmed from an actual marathon in Afghanistan that was organized to allow women to run without fear of persecution or being attacked. Now, the idea caught on and it spread all across Canada, but this is the first time that it's been done here in St. John's. And earlier today, I spoke with two of the organizers about why they wanted to bring this race here. Well, we're here to do a fun run or walk despite the weather. Uh, it's beautiful in the park to support the Secret Marathon 3K, which is an event happening uh, coast to coast in Canada this evening. We are first at 6.30 p.m. and it'll go right to uh, Victoria uh, for the final run in Canada. The Secret Marathon uh, 3K is to support safe running everywhere for everyone, uh, but it is based upon a uh, 2016 Afghanistan marathon and documentary called The Secret Marathon. This year is coast to coast officially. Last year they had races that only stretched as far as from the west coast of the country as far as Ontario. And this year we have Halifax, New Brunswick, as well as Newfoundland. And why was it important for you both to get it here in St. John's? Well, we're big runners. Um, we absolutely believe in the ability that everybody should be free to run whenever, wherever. You shouldn't have to plan ahead and know where you're going to make sure you're safe. Pre-registration online, uh, yesterday was 25. Uh, we'll be given the numbers now at five o'clock for uh, online. And I expect maybe 10 to 20 extra bodies coming through, but we've had a lot of uh, buzz the last couple of days. So we, we're prepared for 80 to 100 come. We will make it work. <laughs> We're in Newfoundland. This is the traditional running weather for eight months of the year. It's actually pretty Christmas snow out right now. Um, even though I don't want it to be Christmas, I want it to be spring. Mm -hmm. um, this is nice weather to run in. It may be a little slippery underfoot, so runners may probably want to exercise some caution. Um, but it's going to be a beautiful night, and hey, no wind. Now, as Claudette said, there, there literally is no wind here tonight. Now, there are a number of runners, more than the 25 that uh, Miss Hobbs was talking about, and a lot of them are, are well-dressed and ready for the conditions. Uh, so they're going to take off in about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, and we'll be here. Uh, so we'll check back in. Uh, I'll check back in with you later on that. Reporting live for here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in Bowery Park in St. John's. Gerald Butts walked into a room full of cameras, reporters, and questioning MPs this morning. All eyes were on Ottawa for the latest on the SNC-Lavalin controversy. The CBC's Julie Van Dusen breaks that down for us. It's coming up.
Welcome back. Well, when it comes to kids and playing outside in the winter, how cold is too cold? On the prairies, communities are experiencing their most frigid season in almost a century, and that has forced many students to spend weeks indoors. But not all of them. Bonnie Allen bundles up and heads out with some hearty kindergarten kids in Regina. For weeks, there have been extreme cold warnings in Saskatchewan with temperatures dipping into the minus 40s and wind chills that could freeze exposed skin within minutes. But while the rest of us hid inside and moaned about it, these little troopers went outside every day. Good morning, dear Earth. The kindergarten class at Prairie Sky School in Regina starts each morning around a cozy fire. Then it's outside for at least an hour to learn and play. Going on a nature walk to see what we can see. Today they're getting a science lesson on magnets. See what else our, our magnets will stick to. The benefits of outdoor learning are well known, but in Saskatchewan, in the winter, it's challenging. In February, there were 23 days when it was at least minus 25 with wind chill. That's the cutoff when most schools in Saskatchewan don't send their kids outside. Teacher Anna Rose says her students used to be trapped inside, but... We went crazy and, and, they, and then, then they got soft and they sort of forgot how to be outside and so even when it was minus 20 they were crying and they were cold. So what you're saying is don't get soft. I, I think we do get soft. I think you know I, I, I think that uh, making it part of our daily routine really helps. The kids come to school dressed and prepared to be outside. Wear a heavy jacket, we wear layers and a took and a scarf. The lesson here, don't escape the cold, embrace it. What's your favorite thing to do outside? Play. Do you have to run around more? Oh, off she goes. No time to talk. The forecast suggests March and April will be colder than normal, but the deep freeze is coming to an end. So perhaps all of us can get outside a bit more. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. To Ottawa now, a close friend and former advisor to the Prime Minister and the country's top civil servant had their say in the SNC-Lavalin affair. Jerry Butts and the Clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, responded to Jody Wilson-Raybould's damning testimony last week at the Parliamentary Justice Committee. Now, she says multiple individuals pressured her to interfere with the criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin. Today, very different accounts of what happened. The CBC's Julie Van Dusen, our parliamentary reporter, has been following the story. So, Julie, what did Butts and Wernick have to say? Well, basically, they disputed everything Jody Wilson-Raybould said last week in that riveting testimony. Um, Butts did it in a very nice way, pointing out the fact that they were friends and had dinners together and so on. He said he was fully aware that two people can experience the same event differently. But he said he never tried to, to pressure her, as she had suggested last week, on the whole SNC-Lavalin uh, file about giving it a deferred prosecution. He said that uh, 9,000 jobs were at stake. He would have liked other legal opinions, but in the end, the final decision was hers. And Anthony, he said the only time he heard that um, she had felt pressure was at the cabinet shuffle in January, and he got a hint of it from Jane Philpott, who suggested uh, that she may have blamed this shuffle on her position on SNC-Lavalin. And as of course, you know, Jane Philpott just quit cabinet. So um, take a listen uh, to Gerald Butts, who said he wished he'd known about it all before. Take a listen. At the end of the day, uh, we really didn't feel uh, that anybody was doing anything wrong. If this was wrong, and wrong in the way it is alleged to have been wrong, why are we having this discussion now and not in the middle of September or October? So, Julie, how receptive were the committee members to hearing that kind of message? Well, I mean, we did also hear from Michael Wernick, the clerk of the Privy Council, who was brought back for testimony. And last week, Jody Wilson-Raybould said that he had issued veiled threats to her about trying to get her on side on the whole SNC-Lavalin file. Uh, he says he doesn't remember it that way at all. Take a listen. She took it as a veiled threat and seems to me, sir, you very much crossed the line in respect of an independent attorney general. Respectfully disagree. 
I never raised partisan considerations at any time. I was giving her relevant context about public interest considerations for a decision that was hers to take, and I never suggested consequences for her. So, I mean, this is very interesting because the Liberals on the committee voted down the idea of bringing Jody Wilson-Raybould back to deal with all these contradictions. Now, she says she is willing to do so, but she needs permission to talk about that period after she was shuffled. It's, uh, it's pretty muddy, so the controversy lives on. All right, Julie, appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. That's our senior reporter, Julie Van Dusen, in our Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. We've got 1,600 people that work for us that rely on us to get that paycheck every week, and we can't fail. We have to deliver. He's the business school dropout who thinks he can save HMV. That's ahead. Welcome back. Well, the 33rd Multicultural Show took over Holy Heart Theatre in St. John's last night. In the past, the event has only been open to university students, but this year it was an open audition. Yeah, more than 20 actors took to the stage last night to perform, and our very nimble Jeremy Eaton, he was there and he put this together. The 33rd Multicultural Show, it's an annual event organized by the International Student Resource Center at Memorial University. We're a fully student-run organization um, and it's back for the 33rd year and we have 18 performances and a fashion show and we're excited. It's kind of like a 50-50 between singing and dancing, but we also have a few instrumental pieces as well. Um, and they're, they're representing, actually, if you think about the countries that the performers are representing or where they're from, we have like a wide range. There's Nigeria, Zimbabwe, India, Sri Lanka, China, the list, list goes on. It has definitely grown. Um, so when I first came here and the first multicultural show I attended was in 2017 um, around this time and that was at the works the field house so it's it's really different and last year we had the opportunity to book holy heart and we've tried to keep it going because the production quality has improved greatly because of it i will be performing uh, my songs 
I wrote a song, number of songs in Indonesia, including here also, with the band The Terra Novas. What's it like being in a band with a guy like Daryl Power? He is, he is a really nice person, and uh, we used to work in the radio station, and he was uh, work for the radio station for free, so it's like he is doing the volunteer job to welcome the, uh, the refugee and the immigrant. So he is a really awesome person. I think it's really exciting because the theme that we're going for is let's embrace and celebrate the diversity and the culture and I think that's really important and it's exciting because I, especially going to Man you see so many different faces, people from so many different countries, so it's really exciting. Well, a defunct record store that had been an international institution in the music business is on the verge of getting another spin. And a Canadian is being dubbed the White Knight who's stepping in to give it a replay. CBC's Diane Buckner introduces us to the entrepreneur who's hoping to re HMV. It's been here since 1921, the original HMV store in London's Oxford Circus. Record stores have had that day, unfortunately. When I was younger, I used to come in here every week. I used to love it. HMV declared bankruptcy in the UK last December. Who would have thought that the record store where the Beatles recorded their demo would go out of business? Now the chain may have new life, thanks to a Canadian that British papers are calling a saviour who will rescue the company. But don't tell him that. Honestly, I find it flattering. I'm starting to blush right In Hamilton, Ontario, this is the so-called savior, Doug Putman, a 34-year-old business school dropout. You know, I just keep saying I feel lucky that we were able to do it. Our customer really likes to actually leaf through it. We're in one of the 85 stores Putman owns in Canada, the Sunrise Records chain. It was HMV Canada until 2017, when that part of the chain went bankrupt. Putman bought it, rebranded every location as Sunrise, and started turning a profit. We know we did it in Canada. We know we're going to do it in the UK. So this is just our toy distribution warehouse. He'll need all his business know-how, which he developed here at his family's toy distribution company. My parents started it uh, 25 years ago, so uh, my dad was a steel worker at Stelco for many years and uh, remortgaged his house with my mom. and took $50,000 and said, let's try it. Customers throughout. He started running the company at age 23 and expanded the operation. The music business, though, presents a special type of challenge. How's it going? In London, at HMV head office, Putman is starting to work with product managers. I mean, it doesn't seem like we get much supplier support. There's not a level playing field at the moment. The challenges are the digital window, which has been there a while now. A hundred stores in the UK will keep the HMV name, but switch to his Sunrise formula. More music-related merchandise, vinyl showcased at the front of the store, wider selection. We've got 1,600 people that work for us that rely on us to get that paycheck every week, and we can't fail. We have to deliver. He has a lot of work to do to earn his savior status. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. What do you know? Yeah, pretty brave guy, but yeah. of course with the rebirth of vinyl, uh, who knows? Yeah, could catch on. He looks pretty confident. <laughs>
Meet Caleb. I blame the doctors for it. I blame God. I was mad about the things that I didn't say and what, you know, things I could go back and change, the memories that we never got to make. Listen up. Thursdays on your local CBC Morning Show. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Well, perhaps you shared this today. I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed not having to hang on to the car door with dear life opening it to come to work this morning. It's a relief, really. Oh, <laughs> the wind on the Avalon, mm -hmm. a break. Yeah, that and just the snow is so pretty. It was a gorgeous day. Yeah. Really. It was what, yeah. exactly what winter should be, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the clock is ticking. It's soon time to spring forward. It is. We're already noticing uh, that we're starting to see these later sunsets, but uh, by the time Saturday night, or rather uh, Sunday morning rolls around, we're going to see those uh, clocks spring forward. <laughs> finally. Um, um, that means we lose sleep, <laughs> we right? Do, we do lose sleep, but we trade that with later sun. I'll yeah. take it. Which is exciting. Yeah. You're glass full. I'm glass half empty. <laughs> I will always, as a meteorologist, always be glass full. <laughs> always. But uh, here are some of the uh, sunset times. By the time the late March rolls around, or at least the end of March, by 8 p.m. will be your sunset time in Lab West, Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, closer to 7.30. But that means about two hours more daylight. So that's certainly good news. And then uh, for parts of the Avalon, St. John specifically, an hour and 49 minutes. By uh, March 31st, we'll be seeing sunsets around 728. So the, the, the uh, spring is certainly near, and that's definitely good news. But as we head towards the weekend, it doesn't look all too bad on Friday. Now, we will start to see some flurries move through, uh, especially towards the evening and afternoon, or afternoon and evening hours, rather, and that will likely be in the way of squalls. So a mix of sun and cloud for most of the island. Up through Labrador, those winds will finally start to ease, and then we'll see some sunshine as well. And then towards the early morning hours on Saturday, we'll see some more cloud cover move in. But it does look like uh, it's not a bad day. Those temperatures are still going to be quite cold, though. So we're hanging on to these below seasonal temperatures. Minus 11 in Cornerbrook. Gander sitting around minus 8, but with plenty of sunshine for your Friday. Again, can't rule out the chance of a few flurries along the west coast, south coast, Avalon and Buren Peninsula in those squalls and then up through Labrador we're sitting uh, in the minus teens minus 14 for Lab City minus 18 in Nain but again we're going to continue to see that strong wind and uh, potential for some flurries so blowing snow will certainly be in the forecast now Friday overnight into Saturday there's that low pressure system it's going to bring some more uh, some more snow through the afternoon, especially for coastal areas of Labrador, heading towards Happy Valley Goose Bay as well into the evening hours. Another system just skirting the Avalon, so we could see that potential for snow again Saturday night, and then eventually that clears out uh, towards Sunday morning, and it looks like a nice day. Maybe a few lingering flurries, but overall a mix of sun and cloud. Then the next system rolls in Sunday overnight into Monday. We'll start to see that cloud cover move in. With this, mainly snow up through Labrador, and then we'll see potentially a changeover, and that's because those temperatures are going to jump up above zero again Monday night into Tuesday. So here's a look at the forecast. Uh, those winds are going to stay strong again tomorrow for uh, St. John's in eastern Newfoundland with gusts near 70 kilometers per hour. Stay breezy through Friday. Sunday, again, as I mentioned, that's when we'll see that sunshine. But then Monday, you see that temperature hovering around the zero degree mark into the afternoon overnight, jumping up to potentially six degrees. So that snow will change over to rain and then continue through the day on Tuesday. Now for central Newfoundland, we'll see that warm up a little earlier on Monday as that system rolls through. But again, seeing that change over from snow to rain, eventually those temperatures will dip back down down below zero through the overnight and then same thing for western Newfoundland. We're going to hang on to those colder temperatures until we get to Monday, but that's definitely when we'll see a little bit of a relief, but with that we'll see that weather. Uh, now in for eastern Labrador, windy tomorrow, about two to four centimeters of snow. Coastal areas will see those winds continue as well. And then western Labrador, breezy tomorrow, about 20 to 40 kilometer per hour winds with flurries right through Sunday and then uh, light snow on tap for Monday. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I'm back. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. 
Well, it's been another grim season for many beekeepers in British Columbia. Hundreds of colonies have been killed off by predatory wasps. Viruses and infestations by mites have also taken a toll. It's a major financial setback for beekeepers. Many are being forced to buy new bees from the southern hemisphere to get ready for pollination season. Rafferty Baker has that story. Colony is just all little bits of bees. So that means wasps have come in and they've bit them in half. As they come down to fight, they bite them, they bite them. Steve Bailey picks through the hundred colonies he lost since the end of the summer. Wasps killed off a third of his hives in Delta. It was a melee. All the full carcasses are wasps that died in the attack. The bees have been cut into pieces. It was devastating. I mean, it's always devastating. Bees are our livestock, so uh, it's no different than if a dairy farmer lost 100 cattle. This is the first time in years that Bailey and his business partner will have to buy new bees before the local crops need pollinating. Now that spring is coming, they're scrambling to clear out all those hives, get new packages of bees from Tasmania, and get ready for the new season. New packages of bees aren't cheap, roughly $200 each. And beekeepers generally don't take honey from a first year hive. So that's about $500 in lost income per colony. In Creston, BC, beekeeper Jeff Lee lost about 70% of his 500 hives this year. Mostly to wasps, but not entirely. Lee recorded this video last fall when the wasps attacked. I can afford to deal with the normal mortality that comes with uh, honeybees, but this one's way off the scale. And from a, an, an emotional point of view, from a, a personal uh, financial point of view, from anything, it, uh, it really hurts. Lee has had to take out a $60,000 mortgage on his home to buy millions of bees from Australia. BC's top bee authority says wasps are a big problem, but only one of many that the insects face. There is no question they can have a huge impact on the overall bee population. But if I look at the province-wide situation, uh, wasps are placing a big role, but not the principal cause for the death of a lot of colonies. For Steve Bailey and his partner, the battle against wasps continues in Delta. They've come up with a solution to try and keep the wasps out of the hives and keep them from killing the bees. It's an advanced version of what's called a robber screen. It blocks the entrance and only the bees from the colony know how to get in and out. Bailey hopes it will give his bees a fighting chance if this year's wasps are as ferocious as the ones that attacked last year. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Delta. Okay, it's it's over now. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah I know. Sad. So many bees. I know wasps. Are they, do you have yeah. problems? Because if you don't know, and I can't imagine you don't, beekeeper, <laughs> uh, do you have wasp issues ever? I haven't yet. I've only had bees for one summer, so right. we'll see. Do you have a little protective screen? I do. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, to keep uh, the shrews and and the mice out as oh. well. But it's you know it's another reason why bees in this province are so special because right. we don't have any of those mites or infestations that. Uh, places right. in other, uh, that other places right. have. Yeah. Good to know. Some other news now, uh, and this has to do with uh, our very own uh, Jeremy Eaton. Sorry, I'm heading on the wrong way there. Um, he's still out there actually watching. He is in Bowering Park. Is he not? Yep. And I think we're going there, but I may be mistaken. There, oh, there he is. We go. I figured he'd be there. <laughs> of course, he checked in. We, we checked in earlier, and not a lot was going on. We'll see what's going on now. Jeremy. Yeah, so th uh, thanks for that uh, lovely intro. Uh, <laughs> I'm still here in Bowering Park. Uh, the race has just finished here behind me and I'm standing with two very talented, very quick runners. Uh, excuse me if I screw up, Keeley Cox yeah. and Mark Didham. Keeley was the first to cross the finish line. Mark came soon after. Keeley, uh, sorry to jump in front of you, Mark. Keeley, can I ask, why did you want to take part in this event? Well, um, I'm very fortunate that I get to get out and run wherever, whenever I can and I feel safe doing it. And there's so many people out running as well, but I heard about like everyone getting out in Afghanistan, how they can't like it's not the same they don't get out they don't have that safe feeling running so i really want to come out and support the cause and show my support for running now mark there are a number of, of, of guys out here but uh, there's obviously more women than men so why did you as a dude want to come out here and support this cause uh i'm a big supporter of just being able to run free i love nothing more than just going being able to go out and just go for a run after work in the morning in the night so just having that right is amazing so 
I, I was going to run. I actually registered for the event, but I'm what they call a fair weather runner, and this isn't fair weather. Uh, it's it's a little bit. There's no wind, as we heard earlier, but there is snow coming down. There's lots of snow on the ground. So what's it like running out in these conditions? Oh, it's definitely slippery. You really got to watch your footing, and I'm usually not a winter runner, so it was a bit different getting out in this tonight, but I'm just happy I got to get out and run with some great people. Just had to be careful more so. And what about you? Are you a winter runner? And what were these conditions like oh, for you? Yeah, year round. It's all good. There's no wind. I'm happy. <laughs> year round, eh? <laughs> yeah, as long as there's no wind, it's, it's a win. All now, pieces. Now, both of them are being very modest, but it was a three kilometer race, and they both ran like, geez, five minutes a kilometer. I can't even do that when it's a nice day. So I want to thank you both, Keely and Mark, for coming out. And they basically crossed the finish line and ran over to chat to me. So thanks so much for doing this. The race is wrapping up here behind me. If we're going to step out of the way, and uh, Eddie, can you get a shot of some people there crossing the finish line? <laughs> so these are the last few runners coming in there now. And uh, here they come. I'm out of breath, and I didn't even do anything. <laughs> so uh, here they come now. To the cheers of the fans, the accolades of being on the local news. Excellent. So that's uh, that's it for here. Uh, us. That's it for me, actually, out here in Bowering Park. They're going to have a little reception afterwards, so I'm mm -hmm. going to throw it back to uh, Carolyn and Anthony in the studio. Thanks, Jeremy. Right. Looks like a lovely night it out does. there. It does. Actually, not so bad. Yeah. You're a little bit slippery, but take your time. Yeah. And some of them are actually going pretty fast. Yeah. Doing very well. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a photo of the sunset this morning in an area on the west coast. Deer Lake. No. Ugh. <laughs> I'll tell you where this beautiful sunrise photo was taken when we come back. All right, wind things down. Yep. All right. With a beautiful sunrise mm -hmm. photo. Yes. Take a look at that one more time. It is nice. Gorgeous. Sunrise, right? Not sunset. Yeah, sunrise. I, I may have said sunset no, there, I don't but know. Uh, it's definitely a sunrise this morning. West Coast. I feel like I've seen it. See the mountains in the background? Yeah. yeah. It is and we're in oh. Steve, of course. Yeah. Very just, nice. When I saw that photo, and it just I just love when it looks like a painting. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things, especially with that ice in there. Randy Alexander captured this gorgeous winter sunrise this morning. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to see or you'd like to see on the show, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca and I will do my best to get them on. I'd like to see more from the COVID. After right. seeing COVID. that video, the snow like, up I would there. like to see you know, more houses. See uh -huh. how bad the snow is. It looks terrible. Yeah, it definitely does. I could see some 
pretty photos. Yeah, I'd like to see a little bit of video of how do you actually get out of that situation because yeah. I have no idea what one does. So Jessica, send us an email and give us a follow. Let us we know. We want to know how you, how you made out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good night. See you tomorrow. Good night, everyone.